Good evening. Uh, my name is Eleanor Hodges, and I'm the director of Eco Action Arlington. Um, Happy New Year. It is my pleasure to welcome everybody to our program this evening, Getting to Carbon Neutrality, Creating a Pathway to Zero Carbon Buildings. Uh, Eco Action Arlington has been very pleased to work with two wonderful partners to bring on this event and our series, the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions Arlington Hum, Hub, excuse me, and the Potomac River Group of the Virginia Chapter of the Sierra Club. We thank them and are uh, enjoying the wonderful partnership. The agenda for this evening, um, we were pleased to have this program moderated by Tom O'Reilly with Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. Uh, we will then be hearing from two speakers, uh, Jennifer Thorne Amon and Susan Stillman. And then following that, we'll have a small panel that will be talking about opportunities for advocacy. And that will be followed by questions and answers from the audience. I also wanted to recognize that this has been um, the third event in a three-part series that started back in September. So for those of you that have not been part of all of these programs, um, the Reimagining Arlington and Reimagining Our Homes programs, we have published all of the event recordings on our YouTube channel. Um, it is now my pleasure to turn the program over to Tom O'Reilly, who will be moderating the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor, and welcome, everyone. Um, and I hope everybody is healthy and staying out of the next blizzard that's coming our way tonight. Um, looks like it's going to be an easier one than, than the first one. I'm the uh, uh, coordinator uh, slash convener of the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions uh, Arlington Hub. FACTS is a, a advocacy organization. It started out in Fairfax. Uh, and it's been going on for about seven or eight years, having great success out there in um, getting Fairfax to become very active in climate action uh, and climate solutions. Uh, we're just getting started in Arlington. Uh, we, our focus is to get communities of faith to get together and um, work with our moral imperative to take care of to take care of the earth, uh, basically. So we will be. We'll give you some more information on that towards the end of the program, as well as the other um, speakers. Uh, I must apologize. I have a bit of an uh, infection in my left eye, so I look a, look a little strange tonight. Um, our first speaker tonight is uh, uh, Jennifer Thorne Aman. Um, she is the Senior Fellow of the Buildings Program at the ACEEE, American Council for the Energy Efficient Economy. Uh, she, uh, Jennifer has been doing this, working in energy efficiency for many years. Uh, she's been with e -E -A -A -E -A -C -E 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 since uh, 1997, so she's been working on this. Uh, before that, she was she's a graduate of the Yale uh, School of uh, Forestry and Environmental Environment, uh, and we've asked her to come and talk about some of the great things that are happening out there in uh, climate action for municipalities. Jennifer? Great. Thanks, Tom. I'm going to uh, just share my screen here and get my presentation started. Let's see. Sorry for the delay. Hopefully, um, everybody can see it now. We got it. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I wanted to talk today about, um, you know, sort of uh, one of the things that I think Susan's going to talk a little bit more about in detail is kind of the policy options that uh, that the organizations are pursuing in Virginia, given the policy constraints in the state. So what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about what are some of the options for decarbonizing buildings, particularly the existing building sector, um, kind of looking beyond those policy constraints. What are some of the things that have been done elsewhere? Uh, some of what we see as we look, um, as ACEEE looks um, each year at what's happening in cities around the country. Um, 
and, and what sort of activities might make sense or, or might work um, in Arlington and other jurisdictions in, in Virginia that do face these same kind of policy constraints. So really to looking toward uh, programmatic and voluntary um, opportunities uh, to address um, existing buildings. Um, so just the obligatory about ACEEE uh, slide, uh, we're a nonprofit research organization in, uh, based in Washington, D.C. Um, I will, uh, you know, we focus on um, analysis uh, to drive policy recommendations uh, for all sectors of the economy relating to energy efficiency. Uh, we do a lot of policy work. And um, the links in this slide are live. So when you get the presentation later, if you'd like to look more at our research or our call to action in which we set bold 2030 goals around um, energy efficiency as a tool for uh, addressing the climate crisis, um, you can check those out um, on your own time. So I thought it would be interesting to start off just talking a little bit about some of the ways that we see that state policy can support local clean energy efforts. Um, so uh, in our state clean energy scorecard, we look at the 100 largest jurisdictions across the country um, to see sort of what's working in terms of clean energy policy. And we find that some of the ways that state policy has the biggest impact include things like you know, establishing stringent statewide building codes, um, including renewable energy ready building code provisions, as well as uh, EV infrastructure ready provisions in building codes, uh, requirements for EV installation and parking facilities, and then uh, statewide policies to benchmark report and improve existing building energy performance. And so if you look um, just at this example graph, it shows sort of the difference that we see where we have some states like Colorado that, you know, out of our 100 point city scorecard scale, you know, get over 10 points because of the state actions, the state policy that's really supporting their clean energy efforts. Um, and in Virginia, we see that that's um, just two points. Uh, because of the building codes that the state does have at the state level. And so while um, they're not the most stringent building codes that we see out there, they're relatively recent. Uh, 2015, we see a lot of states out there that are still operating with the 2009 code. Um, but many of those states will allow their local jurisdictions to adopt a stronger code. So um, the two jurisdictions in Virginia that are included in our scorecard, just for your um, information, are uh, Virginia Beach and Richmond. So they're benefiting uh, from the state's effort to uh, adopt these stronger, uh, to adopt building codes. But overall, the net effect of that state action or state inaction can really be a plus or a minus for jurisdictions. And so this shows sort of the net impact. And you see that even with that two, two positive points for energy, efficient, energy efficient codes, uh, Virginia is at a net negative of 10.5 points, you know, a significant set of points that their cities are struggling um, to, to make advances in the scorecard because they're really being held back by state policy. So in light of that, um, we find that community initiatives, uh, targeted voluntary programs, and local incentives uh, can really help fill that gap when mandatory requirements are off the table for, for cities. Um, and that a focus on uh, policy directives and uh, activities like code compliance and enforcement, which is led at the local level, can really, um, can really help improve uh, the the outcomes of the state uh, code policy for cities, and that another way that cities can really have an impact is by advocating for stronger code adoption at the state level. And you know, many jurisdictions will partner together uh, to approach the state and to direct those advocacy efforts in collaboration with you know nonprofits and others, um, industry organizations, others that are interested in seeing an improvement. In, in code, uh, in code uh, stringency in the state. Uh, we also see that federal support and federal funding can really bolster local initiatives. And so it's a great idea for local jurisdictions to really look into what they can do, how they can better leverage um, federal funds 
what type of federal programming they might be eligible for and to stay on top of uh, new opportunities as they arise. So I'm going to talk about each of these things as we go on. But I did want to point out that, you know, despite the negative impact of uh, these state policies, and we see here Arizona, Virginia, and Wisconsin, I think have some of the strictest um, interpretations of the Dillon Rule uh, among states. They really limit what their, uh, what their local jurisdictions can do. And so despite these penalties that the cities face, um, we saw that Madison, Wisconsin actually earned our most improved rating in the 2021 scorecard. Uh, they had an 11 point increase over their 2020 scores. And so they're really, really trying to work with some of these different strategies to overcome the limitations placed on them by the state. So to start off with, I wanted to talk a little bit more about how effective decarbonization uh, really acts to align climate goals with other local priorities. And these can be things that we've really seen a lot, uh, really emerging issues over the last several years. Uh, racial and social equity, certainly top of mind for, uh, for policymakers um, and, and uh, communities across the country. Public health was something that was really a growing concern even before the pandemic. And then grid flexibility, which is really going to be a critical way for us to ensure that uh, we have a grid that can be flexible to changing needs, uh, can be flexible to increasing amounts of uh, distributed energy resources coming on to the electric grid, and really addressing, um, uh, addressing the overall need for more clean energy resources in our uh, energy generation and energy use mix. So while all of these things are really great, you know, priorities we want to work toward along with our climate goals, um, including them in these policies can really increase the support, the buy-in and the funding opportunities that are available from the community, uh, from the local community, from policymakers at the local, state, and federal level. It really helps to underscore the many benefits that these policies have, not just for climate action, but in meeting a lot of other, uh, a lot of other uh, priorities that, that often do fall to local governments. And you can also help get more support from critical stakeholders. Uh, and one example, grid flexibility is a really, uh, a really key issue for utilities right now. And so having them understand the way that some of the uh, decarbonization activities that benefit the community can also benefit utilities may be a way to bring them on board to work more closely um, with cities and with communities, um, even if they're not, uh, you know, if they're not um, really bought in on energy efficiency, or if they're not facing, uh, you know, strong energy efficiency or clean energy targets from, uh, from the state or and the state regulators. So digging in a little bit more specifically on some of the opportunities, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the opportunities that we see in commercial and large multifamily buildings, and then um, I'll turn to residential uh, single family and smaller multifamily buildings. So one example that I wanted to, to talk about was you know, the opportunity to expand engagement with the private sector, with building owners and managers, as well as tenants. And I think a really great example of this is the Atlanta Better Buildings Challenge, um, where the, the city has effectively uh, developed a target to get 20% energy savings per building, really working closely with the, the commercial sector. So this goes beyond uh, the Better Buildings Challenge that we've seen um, in other cities and even in Arlington County. Um, Arlington has had great, uh, really great results working with uh, the county owned facilities and even in encouraging benchmarking, um, voluntary benchmarking of commercial facilities. But I think what Atlanta has done is, has, is really exciting because they've really you know, worked closely. They've brought together foundation funding, um, local uh, nonprofits and advocates, uh, local technical expertise, um, and the buildings uh, industry to work together 
to, uh, to actually see these improvements in buildings. You know, many of the cities um, have found that, you know, that benchmarking, while it's great and can lead to some improvements in operational energy efficiency, uh, we're not seeing the kind of investment in deeper retrofit um, as a result of those, uh, those actions alone. So the thing that's been really great is their success in Atlanta in actually getting uh, so many buildings to come along and actually develop uh, and actually move toward uh, deep uh, savings targets. So they targeted 20% energy savings per building. They've achieved that in over 100 million square feet um, of buildings in the city. That's from, um, they now have over uh, 600 properties totaling 114 million square feet participating and uh, not all of those have achieved that 20 percent yet but by engaging in this activity they've been able to collect a lot of really valuable data for the city um, to look at and see where are they getting savings so i, I put in this uh, <clears throat> graphic that i thought was really interesting that shows which sectors of the economy you know which building sectors are really being able to you know really achieving this higher level of savings you know who's able to go beyond 20 percent where are we seeing uh, up to 35 percent savings and where are there um which seg segments have been struggling and that can really help inform future program um, activity uh policy activity you know how do you target um and and help those that are, are struggling and meeting those deeper goals so we see that you know these voluntary types of programs can really achieve those near-term savings that are so critical for addressing climate. We know that any of the savings that we can get, those carbon reductions that we can get, you know, today and in the near future, um, have, you know, are, are so important to helping us meet those long-term goals and really limit the impact of climate change. Um, so not only can we get those near-term savings. But these types of voluntary programs can really prepare the, the market for eventual mandatory requirements, helping to build up well, workforce capability, um, helping to just um, normalize the type of work that needs to be done to, 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 to achieve these kinds of savings. We also find a real role for non-financial incentives. And I think this is really important uh, for policymakers to think about when looking at the commercial sector in particular, where uh, they don't have the same limits on their access to capital that we see among small multifamily building owners and homeowners, um, and where they're more able to finance uh, programs and, um, and find other kinds of incentives. So technical assistance can be really important. Um, in Atlanta, the South Face Institute has worked closely with buildings to help support their efforts to identify and, and implement uh, retrofit activity. Um, expedited permitting and preferential zoning, I know these are things that have been helpful in Arlington's efforts. Um, and then facilitating the installation of solar and EV infrastructure across the jurisdiction. Uh, this is happening all across the country um, and uh, has been a really great way to uh, for cities to engage the private sector without um, large outlays of incentives. And then finally, workforce development um, is really important. And I thought one really interesting case that, uh, that I'd come across is I saw that the city of Sacramento used a million dollars of their $10 million CARES um, uh, federal stimulus funding uh, to do workforce training around energy efficiency jobs. So really helping to build up the capacity of their community to help achieve their goals moving forward. In single family and multi and smaller multifamily, we find that those financial incentives do become much more important um, to support deeper retrofits. Uh, you know, there have been a lot of efforts to try to bring down the cost of deep retrofits, um, you know, and even with some success in that, we find that these projects, uh, ACEEE um, uh, published a report last month, um, and we found that these projects do typically cost anywhere from 35 to 55 or even $60,000 per home. And so with those kinds of large costs, we really do see that the financial incentives are the only way that we're going to make progress in scaling up retrofits in the in the residential sector. So these can include uh, financial incentives for envelope upgrades and equipment replacement. You know, flexibility is really key to meeting the needs of homeowners. We need to meet homeowners um, and uh, small building landlords where they are. Um, 
you know, rather than trying to follow a perfect path for retrofit, you know, you've got to do the envelope and then do equipment. We really need to find people with, you know, what are the needs that they have in their homes at this time and how can we help meet them? What kind of incentives can we offer and how can we best um, address the needs um, as they stand? Um, also targeting incentives to low and moderate income homeowners and renters is, uh, you know, is really important, really can help us meet our social and racial equity goals and, um, and really uh, leverage the dollars where they're going to have the most impact. Um, looking at direct install measures, and I think this is something that local governments can really look into. What opportunities do they have to do bulk procurement of measures that they can then um, offer uh, particularly to, um, to uh, cash constrained uh, consumers. And so I'm looking at things beyond light bulbs and faucet aerators. I think, you know, those have been the sort of the bread and butter of uh, direct install programs for quite some time. And we really want to look beyond that to look at some of the new technologies that are out there that offer lower cost opportunities to really capture some of those near term savings. We really want to look at things where you know, we know we're not going to be able to um, to shift everybody to heat pumps right away. You know, people have gas systems that have 10, 15, 20 years of remaining life. How do we get near term gas savings? Well, some of it's through doing things to reduce heating load, to reduce water heating load. And there are a number of low cost strategies, including cellular shades and storm windows, uh, water heating measures. Uh, that can really help to do that. And, um, you know, I'd be happy to provide anybody with more information on some of these technologies um, uh, after the after the session today. And then co coordinating community led initiatives, you know, where the city really works closely with community based organizations across the community um, to develop local neighborhood retrofit campaigns that really speak to the neighborhoods and their uh, specific concerns and interests. And then also doing uh, working with nonprofits to provide training for workers so that they can provide energy services in their local area. So these are all things if you look at our local policy resources, you can see case studies of all of these different things being tried around the country. Um, and then leveraging that external support and funding. Um, as I mentioned, federal programs and dollars uh, can really help fill in uh, in lieu of state support. Uh, the American Rescue Plan Act has providing uh, funding to states and local governments um, for climate, health, um, and equity activities. Uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act has more of these opportunities. And if we can get the Build Back Better bill passed, uh, you know, I encourage you all to, to continue advocating for that. There are tremendous incentives and there will be programs through that bill that will be um, that will have funding directly delivered from DOE to local governments. And so any government, you know, any area that has programs in place or is working on the infrastructure to develop local programs will be able to take those funds. Um, you know, more successfully uh, garner those funds and get them into the hands of their local community and get those uh, projects underway faster. Um, we also see um, uh, additional support and greater funding through um, HUD's Community Development Block Grants and DOE's Energy Efficiency and Community Development Block Grants, as well as through the, the LIHEAP and the Weatherization Assistance Programs that are already active. So we're going to see a, a big increase in funding through those programs, and that's a real great opportunity for, for cities to work directly with the federal government to get those funds for their communities. Um, engaging utilities to partner on incentives and other program activities. This is something that we've seen work even in places where the uh, local utilities have fallen behind um, other utilities in the region. Um, in Madison, Wisconsin, they signed an MOU with their local uh, investor owned utility to work together toward energy and greenhouse gas emissions goals. Um, promoting efficiency and renewable energy kind of going above and beyond what was required by the regulators. Um, you know, um, I encourage everyone to, to, you know, think about how, you know, what strategies could be done, how to better engage, um, engage Dominion um, and the other utilities that service your area to try to go to push things forward. Um, but I know you guys are more of the experts on Virginia and, uh, and uh, can, can think about the, you know, what opportunities there might be there. And then finally, exploring community choice aggregation as a way to increase green energy supply 
um, in your cities. Uh, Virginia has enacted legislation to allow communities to do to work with community choice aggregators. Um, the last I heard, there weren't any programs active. No communities had stepped forward to do that in Virginia, but a number of other states have done this and pr would provide lots of great experience for how, um, how communities in Virginia could move forward. Uh, so finally, I just wanted to leave you with some information on some ACEEE resources. Uh, we have a recent paper called Ready to Go, which actually talks about how states and local governments can work directly uh, to get the most out of the federal funding. Um, that's coming, sort of like ready to go and take advantage of those federal dollars and federal programs. Uh, the latest edition of our Clean Energy Scorecard is available on our website. Uh, we also have a whole host of local policy resources that have case studies, uh, toolkits, policy briefs, and then a state and local policy database that really digs into more detail about what's available and what can be done at the state at the city level. Um, so I thank you for your attention tonight. I look forward to the discussion and, and uh, any questions I might be able to answer um, as the evening moves on. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. That was really informative and um, in, in a lot of ways encouraging that we might actually find ways to move forward. Uh, it seems like voluntary incentives are a major piece of that. Uh, and looking at I was going to ask you for a city that you might recommend us to, and it sounds like Madison, Wisconsin, has done uh, some good work with a within a Dillon rule state, as you as you know, indicated. So yeah, um, I think that's true. And there, I, I you know I don't yeah you know, as I was digging into this deeper, I think you know it, it seems that Virginia has you know has the tightest Dillon rule, and I and I saw other people were really seem to be able to to get around it in more ways. So um, I think it is a challenge, but Madison is probably um, you know more more similar to Arlington in terms of of size and uh, some of the the interests of the community there. But I would also say, I mean, I'm looking at the participants here, and we have 69 participants tonight, and I think that speaks volumes to what what you guys can accomplish in Arlington. Great. Well, thank you for your vote of confidence. And if anybody wants to learn a lot about energy efficiency, uh, go to the uh, ACEEE website and spend a couple of hours or a couple of days just going through their reports and their studies to see what's what's out there. Um, thank you very much, Jen. Uh, and I would like to turn to um, Susan Stillman. Susan is the, uh, in, uh, let me see if I got it right, the at-large executive committee member for the Sierra Club chapter of, in Virginia. Um, she's been working to overcome, and she'll be talking about overcoming some of these regulatory and legal barriers, as well as talk a little bit about some successes that we had in the last session of the General Assembly, which we hope to be able to hold on to. Um, uh, Susan, I'll turn it right over to you. Well, I'm having trouble defining my presentation here on my screen. Can um, Eleanor, can you bring it up? Sure. Um, do you want to just introduce yourself and give me one minute? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm Susan. Do this. I'm Susan Stillman. I live in Vienna, Virginia, and um, I'm on the executive committee for the Virginia chapter of the Sierra Club. And um, thank you very much for having the opportunity to come speak to you all tonight. Um, I'm you know, down on the ground here trying to work um, on legislation and on administrative processes as it relates to building codes and um, renewable energy. There we go. So there we go. All right, thank you. So anybody who's had an energy audit done on their house, um, this is the image of a cat with an infrared camera. Um, so you know where the hot spots and the cold spots are, and that's a, a great way to move on with energy efficiency. So Eleanor, you're gonna have to move the slides for me, right? Mm -hmm. So as I, so how do we decarbonize Arlington's built environment? Um, well, we've had some successes in the last couple of years on legislation that will help change how we generate electricity. And I'm gonna go into detail on, a little bit of detail on these two bits of leg legislation, but the Virginia Clean Economy Act and the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Um, we'll get into a bit more later, but that's legislation that passed in the last two years. Um, we need to make our built environment more efficient. Homeowners need to demand efficiency when they, efficiency and information about efficiency when they buy homes and they need to be asking for all electric homes. We can clean up the grid, we can't clean up fossil fuels. 
So we need to go all electric. Beneficial electrification is a term that you need to be um, studying. And Rocky Mountain Institute is a great place to get more information about that. The Commonwealth of Virginia needs to update the building code. We have a mashup of 2009, 2012, 2015 um, building code. We need to be adopting the current um, international building code. And existing buildings need to have improved efficiency and move to electricity. Um, as Jen said, you know, as a gas furnace um, comes to its end of life, replace it with a heat pump. Could you go to the next slide? So the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative um, is a carbon trading program. I'll get into some detail about that in another slide. Um, the Virginia Clean Economy Act gets us to zero carbon electricity by 2050. Um, we've gotten some legislation passed as well um, that helps with distributed elect uh, solar generation. So the Solar Freedom Bill, um, many of the provisions are in the VCEA. That helps us with um, a higher number of people that can net meter in the state within Dominion's territory. It allows Fairfax County to build a huge solar array on a closed landfill, um, which wasn't allowed before that, and some other things. And then there's a policy goal um, of getting to a net zero energy eco economy wide by 2045. And that's in the Commonwealth Energy Policy Plan. That's not law specifically, it's policy. Um, and it was updated in 2021. So that's some of the major legislation. I have a link to um, more details about the legislation in our resource slide at the end. Eleanor? So the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, it's carbon credit trading. And it, go, it goes on with the states that you see here. And it's really been successful. This is the first year that we've had it. And we garnered $228 million this year. And that money goes to retrofitting the homes of low-income people for greater energy efficiency and coastal ad adaptation in Southeast Virginia, where they're having horrible problems with sea level rise due to climate change. So um, this has been a very successful program in its first year. So we have to we have to hang on to this, and you'll see that it's at risk when I move on. Um, Eleanor, the next slide. And then we have the uh, Virginia Clean Economy Act. Um, one of your local delegates was the House sponsor, Rip Sullivan. Um, and so this is a great plan that gets us to keep lowering our, our carbon emissions um, after, well, starting now and after 2030. And it authorizes offshore wind. It made offshore wind in Virginia in the public interest, which means that the State Corporation Commission has to authorize it when it comes up. And that's really going to be an interesting program. It's a huge opportunity. Virginia has a very large unobstructed port. And Siemens Gamesa has already said that they're going to bring a manufacturing um, facility here for wind turbines. So it's really going to be a great opportunity um, for clean energy and for jobs. Next slide, please. And then also in the VCEA, was mandatory energy efficiency on the demand side. So that means that the, the investor-owned utilities, Dominion and APCO, have to spend money to help people make their homes more energy efficient. Those are low goals. They're pretty sad. But of course, they can be increased, right? At least we've got a stake, we've got a stake in the ground, and we can uh, raise the percentage of savings that they need to be um, helping folks achieve. Next slide. And I don't know about you, but I get my Dominion bill. Um, fortunately, it's very small because I have solar panels on my house, but I get my Dominion bill electronically. And so I don't see all of the opportunities that are out there um, that people who get paper bills see unless I go to the website. So there's the um, website where you can go and find programs that will help you with some of these um, energy efficiency programs. So there's air sealing, there's attic insulation, basement wall insulation, and so on and so forth. You see the list. Um, it is, there's lots of information out there. It's actually pretty overwhelming. Um, lots of caveats, lots of restrictions, read the fine print, but there are energy audits included in this program. So there, there's some great stuff out there. 
and it, it warrants taking some time um, to investigate for your own benefit. Next slide, or folks that you, other folks that you know that might live in older homes. Um, as Jen said, we need to be really mindful about equity um, when we're moving to energy efficiency and to um, clean energy. And so in these, I talked to you about the energy um, efficiency program in REGI. There are also programs in the VCEA. Um, there is a PIP program in the VCEA, which means that low and moderate income folks don't have to pay more than a certain percentage of their income for their utilities. They don't get stuck with paying 15% of their income for electricity or electricity and gas. So that's a great um, equity component to the VCEA. There's a low income set aside uh, for the shared solar program, what, what you might call community solar. Now that program's not live at the moment. There are some issues with it. It's in the State Corporation Commission for some tinkering, let's hope, um, but let's hope we get community solar soon. And there's a multifamily shared solar um, program and solar freedom. So being able to put solar on apartment buildings or condominiums. And then of course, there's jobs involved in um, solar, offshore wind, and um, energy efficiency. And you can't ship the installation of these things to China. So they're jobs that stay here. Next slide, please. And what is the what's the politics of green energy? Well, there's an intersection here. Republicans like things that are low cost. They like things that are private investment. Democrats are concerned about climate and they're concerned about equity but they're both concerned about jobs. And so the more we can bring um, new and innovative jobs to folks in Virginia through green energy, the better and the more success we'll have. Next slide. So uh, Jen talked a little bit about the Dillon rule. Um, I'll get some more detail on that. What, these are the things that are holding us up, the Dillon rule. We can't make our own rules. We have to get mother may I from the state. Um, the building code administrative process is pretty cumbersome. Um, there's a flaw in the community solar bill. There's a minimum bill of $75, and that's with not garnering any electricity. That's just a play. And so that program won't work until we get rid of that minimum bill. Um, and then we're going to be playing defense in the General Assembly this year. Um, Go the governor elect Youngkin has said that he would repeal the greenhouse gas initiative. Um, he said he would not have signed the Virginia Clean Economy Act. Um, he also this week nominated Andrew Wheeler, who was uh, President Trump's EPA administrator. We're going to have a tough row for the next four years. Um, so come and support us, come help with these programs. Um, next slide, please. So we, we've beaten the Dillon rule to death, but it's what keeps Arlington from being able to have um, the things that it would like to make its environment more efficient and get and constraining your ability to get to carbon neutrality. The building code is statewide. The building code applies the same here as it does in Southwest Virginia. So this consortium that I work that the Sierra Club started um, that has other players, the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions is a really strong component of this coalition that I'm working with. And they've worked with Senator Boisco. She'll be the chief patron on a bill that allows for stretch codes, which are energy efficiency codes more stringent than the state building code. A requirement that building, building energy efficiency be information be available, uh, oops, available at real estate point of sale. So you know before you buy what the um, energy consumption is of a building. Requires public disclosure of energy utilization intensity, which is benchmarking, you'll hear the term EUI, um, of all existing new government commercial and multi-unit residential buildings, and allows local governments to incentivize um, EUI reductions in government and, and larger commercial buildings. That's the proposed um, legislation that the Senator is putting forward. We haven't seen it come out of drafting yet, so we don't know the details, but that's the gist of the idea. Um, we also think that um, Delegate Sullivan will have benchmarking legislation. 
So that will be really great as well. Next slide. So contrast Virginia with our neighbor next door, Maryland, which is a home rule state. Maryland's building code is up to date. They have a set, their law says that one year after the IECC, the International Energy and Conservation Code is, is promulgated, that Maryland adopts it. No questions asked, just do it. And localities can have more stringent building codes than the state building code, and they do. Montgomery County has a more stringent building code than some other counties in the state. Um, and so a home built in Maryland to code is more efficient than a home built to code in Virginia. And they're the same builders, right? The builders work across state lines. So they know how to do this work. They just need to be pushed to do it. Next slide, please. So the, um, how does our build, building code come about? Um, we have a board of housing and community development. Board members are selected by the governor from each of the congressional districts. That's to get sort of equal, equal representation. Board members are often affiliated with the building community. Um, the focus is on first cost rather than cost of ownership and health and comfort. So a more energy efficient home is less expensive to operate. And so where you, where you say, well, it's gonna cost more to start out. Well, yeah, it might cost a little bit more to start out, but over the ownership or the life of that home, it costs less to operate. Staff often sides with the builder community. It's called regulatory capture. They, those are the people they work with day in and day out. And so there's an influence there. It's difficult for consumers to be represented in the building code process. It's a two or three year process. You have to go to all these meetings, you have to participate. Um, that's the work that we're trying to do with our coalition. But the public can speak at the board meetings. So there are opportunities to weigh in and, and let them know what you'd like to see happen. Next slide, please. So what are we advocating in this round of the um, building code cycle? We'd like to see that the current international building code be adopted without any weakening amendments, the same as what Maryland does. We'd like for all the homes to be solar ready. And what does that mean? That means you have a cable or a wire, a conduit that allows you to, to get from the um, electrical panel to the, to the roof so you can install solar panels without having to punch walls or anything like that. The same is true for cooking and heating. I just put an induction cooktop in my house and the electrician had to punch a lot of holes to run that wire from the panel to the kitchen. And that was expensive over and above just you know, getting the um, cooktop. The same thing for heating. If somebody wants to convert from gas to um, a heat pump, we wanna see the wires are there. The same thing with EV charging. Have it set up so that there's a wire that runs from where the cars are parked to where you would want to the electrical panel. So it's really easy to install an EV charging um, system. And we'd like to see the elimination of resistance heat for primary heating sources. What I'm talking about when I say resistance heat, I mean um, the little meat, uh, radiators that run along the floor. I grew up in a home like that because there was a moratorium on natural gas when my dad built the house. Um, it's a really expensive house to heat. We'd like to see it set up so that heat pumps are the default for um, electric heating. Next slide, please. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions. This is my resource slide. So there's a link there for energy bills if you want more detail. Um, there are a lot of acronyms in this energy business. And so I built an acronym decoder. Um, we'll come out with a decoder ring later, but right now you have to go to a, a website. And then if you'd like to get involved in advocacy with the Sierra Club, um, you know, we're over 20,000 members in the state of Virginia and many more supporters. Um, we'd love to have you join us as well. And that uh, Dominion Elect uh, Energy Efficiency Program that I talked about, that's the link for that. Um, this is pretty dry stuff. If you'd like to be entertained and informed, um, subscribe to Ivy Main's blog, Power for the People VA. She makes it a lot of fun to learn about some very dry information. Um, and my 
information for contact if you should like to reach out to me is stillman.susan at gmail and i'd be happy to communicate with you thanks so much thank you very much susan the um uh you you've laid out a difficult uh, environment for us to move forward i i we know that and i must say uh, susan is coordinating a work group that meets every two weeks as well as as necessary to as the to try to influence the building code process uh, and if you think the acronyms and the uh, technology that she's talked about as she gave her pre presentation here is tough once you get into the building code it gets really detailed uh, really really difficult to follow but uh, hard work that's it's going to happen and susan you mentioned that there would be opportunity for public input at the both the building code and would there also be um, public input for the community solar uh, process so the um, state corporation commission is typically not a place where there's a lot of public um, testimony so i don't think so um, one place you could stay tuned to that is the solar united neighbors folks they're working on um, the community solar um, thing but the state corporation commission doesn't um, that's just not part of their bailiwick Okay. Is there and is there is there is does the legislature play a role in the whole building code process here? They well, you saw the legislation that uh, Senator Bosco is going to put forward um, that has to do with the stretch codes and the benchmarking and the in, um, information about energy consumption. Mm -hmm. The state legislature really likes to stay out of the building co uh, building code business. They're like, we don't want to legislate building codes. Um, eventually, of course, we would like for them to legislate that Virginia just adopt the, the national standard um, right. without discussion. Um, and last year we got some legislation passed that encourages them, encourages the board housing community development to consider more than just first cost, to right. consider the cost over the uh, life of the home, to consider the health uh, benefits. Um, one of the organizations that's going to be it is part of our coalition is going to be testifying at the board of housing community development community development is a Virginia physicians for climate uh, responsibility and so they're going to make a really strong argument about why their health issues um, in related to the building code. Excellent. Excellent. Yes, I've seen some of the uh, some of the comments by the building industry on the code where they miraculously find that it's much more expensive that they the cost is much higher than the benefit for any possible change, uh, which right. is sort of their, their strategy that goes. And we on. have some nice DOE uh, data that counter um, counters those arguments. Yes, we do. Okay, thank you very much, uh, and uh, for for that and the the downside of the Dillon rule, of course, is always out there. Uh, Susan touched base. I'm going to turn this into a discussion about by some of our. Uh, local groups uh, and what we're doing in terms of advocacy. Um, Susan talked about the uh, FACTS proposal, uh, which is going forward with Senator Boykin uh, uh, as a sponsor, which would allow, it will do those four things that she mentioned. It would allow uh, local governments to enact more stringent uh, energy codes. It would require point of sale this is of inter, uh, to disclose energy use so when you go to buy a house you know how much your utility bill may be uh, this is a consumer a consumer thing actually so uh, as well as benchmarking which if we're ever going to get energy efficiency mandates in this in the county we need to know the the benchmark we need to know where we're starting from um, and we are pushing uh, fax is pushing that uh, at the state level uh, we've spoken to all of our senators and all of our representatives local representatives and got fairly good support uh, but we'll be asking as, as we go through that legislative process we'll be asking for more support from from you the the, the audience and the people out there uh, and with that i want to turn it over I think our to uh, to John Bloom. I think was on our list for next. John is the um, chair of the Potomac River Group of the Sierra Club, uh, and has been on the he's on the C2E2 Commission, the, the 
uh, Climate Change and Energy Efficiency Commission of the, of the county um, and has been doing that for a couple of years. Uh, John? Thanks, Tom, and hi, everyone. Uh, and so as Tom mentioned, I'm, I'm chair of the Potomac River Group, and that's our local CR club that covers Arlington and Alexandria and Falls Church. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about the CR club just because it's a little bit complicated. Susan Stillman, who I work with all the time, but you know, she works uh, with the state chapter that covers the whole state on, you know, working on legislation and things like the state building code. And uh, the CR club works at the national, state and local level and has organi organizations at each level. And we all do our best to coordinate with each other, but you know, there are 800,000 volunteers and it's, uh, you know, always a challenge. Uh, so aside from telling you a little bit about the club, you know, I will share one slide that just gives a little bit of information uh, while I talk. Let me see. That should do it. I hope that's up on your screen now. Yep, we've got All it, right. John. Good. Good. So, um, uh, and that's just if you want some contact information and that sort of thing. Uh, I think Susan gave the state uh, website. Here's the local website. You can join the Sierra Club and, and sign up for newsletters from both places. Um, uh, so the Sierra Club is very active in Virginia, has 13 staff across the state, and, uh, and we do a lot of lobbying in Richmond, and we bring a lot of lawsuits on behalf of the environment. Um, and we're also active politically. It's, it's one of a few organizations that endorse candidates and, and uh, you know, enthusiastically gets engaged in the political process, because as we learn over and over again, elections matter. Um, so I'll mention a few ways that people can get involved and that I would suggest they get involved uh, uh, more deeply in these issues uh, if they're interested. One is uh, just to get plugged into good information sources. Uh, and I think by being on this, uh, this webinar, that's what you're doing. Uh, and, but there, you know, it's always more, there are wonderful sources out there. Uh, and uh, mailing lists you can get on and that sort of thing uh, to get deeper into climate issues. That's kind of top level. And then if you want to get involved locally, uh, then I would say pick you know one or all of, of the organizations sponsoring this webinar. Uh, and there are others as well, other good organizations. Uh, you know, join but then make make personal contact with a couple of people in an organization that you might want to get personally involved in and and talk to them because i i certainly at the sierra club and i think the other groups work the same way we want to find out uh what your interests and and skills are and match you up with um you know the right kind of role uh, uh and and we can tell you about what goes on in our organizations and more generally um in, in the county and the region. Uh, and then aside from getting involved, I just wanted to make a pitch for two other ways that you can do it. And one is be a climate voter. You know, I mentioned before elections matter. And uh, so um, being active uh, politically on behalf of, of uh, candidates that are uh, doing the, you know, prioritizing climate action is a wonderful thing to do. And so is being a climate donor. Um, and this isn't just a pitch for the Sierra Club. There are many great groups out there. Sierra Club's one of them, but there are, there are the other sponsors, you know, EcoAction and, and FACTS do wonderful work, as do a number of other environmental organizations. And we understand some people have more time than money, uh, and some people have more money than time. And what, you know, just give what you can of, of both. Uh, and uh, I look forward to more discussion both on the issues and on how to engage. Thanks. As I as I said, they, uh, I've been work, trying to organize the Arlington Hub for Facts for a while, and John has been um, one of my primary sources of information and, and inspiration as we go forward here. So thank you. Uh, next, I'll turn to Joan McIntyre. Joan is the chair, current chair of the C2E2 Commission, which advises the county board on uh, climate and energy issues. Uh, she is also the 
uh, was the past board chair of Eco Action, and is one of these people that just sort of has a, has a doing amazing work in the world of climate change advocacy. Joan. Right. Thanks. Well, Eco Action Arlington, throughout our 40 plus year history, in that promotes and protects and improves air, water, and quality, and really tries to link up people with information and resources for better stewardship and to live a more sustainable lifestyle. Um, through much of our 44 year history, we've done advocacy ad hoc, um, but not, not in any regular sustained manner. But, but starting in 2019, we adopted an advocacy policy and set up an advocacy committee. And this was really in recognition of the fact that dealing with climate change, dealing with the other environmental challenges we face really requires addressing a lot of the structural in issues that individuals through their own actions really, really can't take. So it, it really complements what we do in terms of promoting volunteer opportunities, stream cleanups, um, providing information more broadly on sustainability. Um, what we're trying to do is both directly engage with county decision makers, both the county board, county staff, um, as an organization, presenting our views and positions and seeking out solutions that would really address climate change and, and other issues. But as important, we're also looking at trying to provide a venue to engage the public, to give them a way of actually having the information and the tools and the opportunities to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, you know, we've had tremendous um, interest in these programs and series, and you know, we talk with people and they they want to do something, they're not sure how to do it. And through this committee, we're, we're seeking to actually um, provide those opportunities and provide the information, just make it a little easier for people. So when we started, we really started, to, we wanted to narrow our focus. So we focused on the um, implementation of the community energy plan, which had been adopted in September 2019 and set a goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, so we're looking at how the, the action, action plan to actually implement it, roadmap. Um, that got us into, you know, what is the budget? What are the capital improvement plans, expenditures? You know, how is the county going about implementing this? And one of the things that we came to, um, certainly by early last year, was that we actually have to think about this as an all of government activity. The county really needs to be much more integrated in how they address climate change and environmental issues. Uh, we've been pushing for a chief sustainability officer, um, climate change officer who could kind of oversee and in that activities, but you know a lot more, and also even for a climate emergency again to make sure that climate actions are integrated in everything that the county does, um, especially in the budget, the capital improvement plans, and a variety of different policies. So that's that's a key focus for us. Um, Zero waste is another area that we've looked at. We've got another group, the R4 Action Group, that has been um, looking at this, and we've done a number of things that we've been quite successful on. We, we helped promote and um, got focused on getting the county to adopt the curbside food waste collection, which started in September. Um, we were also very active in engaging citizen support for a plastic bag fee. Again, that went into effect on January 1st. Um, and then we've also looked at issues related to recycling and waste in, in the schools. Uh, so that's been another venue. And then beyond that is it's the broader education and outreach to the community to get information to people that they need in order to um, be better advocates and better voice their um, opinions. And in that we're doing, we have these series here, um, just you know, getting good, good speakers, um, and also, you know, we have, we've had a couple of um, forums where we've brought in candidates for the county board to talk about environmental issues. Um, and then again, we're looking to provide opportunities, whether it's a petition drive, which is what we did on the plastic bag tax, um, getting people to send letters to the county board um, in relation to um, the county budget, um, other programs and policies that they're considering. Um, we'll provide sample letters, uh, try to make it easy, encourage people to speak at county forums and meetings. Also just trying to share them, you know, here's how you go about doing it. Um, and then we will be working closely with PACs and um, 
Sierra Club as well as the broader uh, collective of environmental groups across Virginia as they, we go into the General Assembly, which will start in about a week or two, um, tracking that and hoping to at least gear people up to sending sending emails to chairmen uh, or to committee members and their delegates, um, getting them to interact with their delegates to voice what our priorities are. Um, and then again, as with FACS and Sierra Club, we're always looking for volunteers um, to help with our advocacy committee um, to help plan, implement, edit. We have a the Eco Advocate, which is our kind of main platform. It comes out on a monthly basis, but it does tend to be tied to actions that, that are going on and opportunities. So, um, you know, having people to help us put that together and edit. And that again is the main venue that people can get information that they want. Um, so again, um, uh, we will be sending out a email following up with this program, um, and I think our Sierra Club and FACTS will be doing the same, just with a little bit more background information. We'll have a survey that people can fill out that will share, tell us what their interests are, so we can, you know, help people who are interested and in get involved to to actually um, match them up with with what they're interested in. Uh, so now I'm actually going to turn it over to Leslie Loudon, who is a um, very great volunteer. She's been, you know, one of the founding members of our advocacy committee. She's worked closely on tracking the site plan development process in Arlington. She's a local architect doing a lot of sustainability design. Joan? Yep. Um, challenges that we face as individual citizens who want to see rapid changes to the way we build are daunting. We've got state level impediments, bureaucratic processes, lengthy meetings, politics, and Eco Action Arlington is here to help. Our highest priority for buildings is to advocate for zero carbon design, which means a highly efficient building that either produces on site or procures enough carbon free energy to meet a building's annual energy consumption. At a minimum, projects should be zero carbon ready by providing infrastructure such as electrical systems to enable zero carbon operations. We also advocate for sustainable design, including site work, transit, and biophilia. Next slide, please. So um, opportunities for influence include uh, a variety of forums in which citizens can offer input on planned developments creating opportunities to elevate the importance of environmental goals. There are several tiers of reviews for projects in various stages of approvals and multiple ways the community can weigh in. The Long Range Planning Committee of the County Planning Commission or LRPC uh, facilitates development of larger scale plans such as the Clarendon Sector, Sector Plan and Planning Langston Boulevard that are currently underway. These plans provide opportunities to emphasize how sustainability is a fundamental planning principle rather than a set of features that get added on later. As we've discussed, Arlington's building codes are governed at the state level, setting the requirements for sustainability measures. So citizens have little input on the codes at the local level. However, many larger developments seek higher density than county zoning permits by right and the county can set higher standards for its own facilities. Individuals, uh, developments seeking higher density must undergo the Site Plan Review Committee or SPRC review. Next slide, please. So the SPRC is a subcommittee of the County Planning Commission which is, advises the county board on growth and development. Upcoming SPRC reviews are posted on its website where anyone can access project design information, staff comments, and previous public presentations. This is the stage at which your voice can be the most influential. Um, actually, can we go back to the uh, last slide? I'm sorry, I wasn't quite ready. There we go. Um, 
So the, the uh, SPRC homepage has useful links, which include a citizen's guide to the process. And the meetings list shows up there, um, which tells you what projects are coming up for review. Site plan typically has two online feedback opportunities on specific topics prior to the SPRC meetings. And each are open for one week, approximately 30 and 60 days after the proposed site plan is accepted by the county. The county staff then prepare a report that includes compilations of the comments. SPRC meetings are, uh, and links to each meeting, um, excuse me, SPRC meetings are typically around 30 days after the online feedback windows. These meetings, which are held in person prior, prior to COVID-19, evolved to virtual plat platforms and links to each meeting are provided on their website. Audio only participa participation by telephone is also available. Comments from the general public may be taken at the end of each of these meetings at the discretion of the SPRC chair and as time allows. Pre-registration is not required. But once the SPRC work is completed, the project is referred to the Planning Commission to finalize its recommendations to the County Board for approval. Planning Commission and County Board meetings provide additional opportunities to weigh in along with emails to the commission and board members where you can express your views. Next slide, please. So each project's page has links to applicant materials that you can review and comment on, along with a history of the review process. Some of these documents are quite technical and EcoAction Arlington can help you find key items. In addition to zero carbon design, we look for things like lead scorecard items classified as maybes and advocate for clear commitments to energy and efficiency uh, and accountability that go well beyond code minimums. Uh, spoiler alert here, not all projects include a zero carbon assessment, much less commitments to such goals. So look for information on EcoAction's website and upcoming issues of the Eco Advocate newsletter for specific specific talking points. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, much appreciated. That is a process. The site plan review process is a very hands-on place where people can be involved. Um, and you can, like uh, Leslie said, you can go work with Eco Action uh, to learn more about that. The What's really important is that people show up, that people show up to talk at the hearings or virtually or in real life, uh, that as we move into the state legislative process, when notes come out from the three groups here to please send a note to the uh, committee chairs or send a note to your senator, uh, give a call down to Richmond, that we do that. We have to show up. If you don't show up, nothing's going to happen. That's sort of the, the, the main piece there. Um, but we do have a really great group of the three these three groups here that are working together on a lot of common um, issues uh, to try to push the county towards carbon neutrality. So uh, I think we can open up the floor for questions now. Do we? Um, uh, the blog, I'll answer that first one. The blog that Susan mentioned is uh, Ivy Main's blog. It's called Power for the People. Uh, and Ivy VA. is VA. Thank you. Just, uh, just Google I mean, Ivy's name, which is pretty straightforward. It's like the Ivy on the tree and Main Street, and it right. will pop up. She, and she, she's been, she's amazing. She writes, uh, she takes very difficult and convoluted issues and makes sense of them for you which is great. So, um, what kind of questions did we have out here? Um, I'll go backwards on some of these. The SEC had a comment period on community solar. Uh, Sun, that's Solar United Neighbors. If people are interested in solar, look them up, Solar United Neighbors. They join with EcoAction every year to do the solar co-op. Uh, they've done that for the past few years which is how I've got solar on my roof um, and we drive drive with sunshine now. 
you know, uh, Eleanor, is it just work these back up? They, uh, I can, I can, yeah, we've got them organized. So Jen, a question for you is what is the effect of stronger codes for hurricane resistance on energy conservation and renewal programs? Yeah, so, um, so there is some uh, overlap between the energy code and items in the energy code and how they impact things like uh, other elements of resilience in the building. So we see this in, uh, you know, the levels of um, insulation, just structural security in the building and so forth. Um, but, you know, there's, um, you know, that's an interesting area uh, for more research, I think, to really understand. Um, and in terms of resilience, one of the things that's most, uh, the biggest impacts of stronger energy codes are making homes uh, safer for people to shelter in place if they need to during power outages and other uh, results of, um, or other consequences of extreme weather. So um, as you can imagine, it's almost like if you, um, if your home is more like an ice chest, right? If it's a really good ice chest, you keep the cool in in the summer and the heat out. And uh, if it's a good thermos, right? You keep the heat in and keep the cold out. And so having those higher levels of insulation that are mandated through stronger building codes can really help um, as we uh, envision a future where there will be more extreme weather and longer periods of time when people might be without power. All right, thanks. And here's a question for Susan under Reggie how much progress has been made in reducing carbon dioxide emissions in participating states? Oh, I don't, I don't have the statistics on um, what that does. Is that something you all keep track of, Jen? Um, yes, I, it's not within my, uh, my area of expertise, but I uh, certainly within um, um, our organization. And then I also think that the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships, which works across the states that participate in REGI, uh, also has information on that. All right, and Jen, um, how much impact can energy efficiency make in decarbonization? What portion or percent is the impact to reach the 2030 50% reduction and the 2050 100% reduction in your analysis? Yeah, so ACEEE's analysis shows that energy efficiency can get us 50% of the way toward our goals. So, um, you know, if you couple that with uh, uh, renewables and other green energy sources um, and other uh, activities, uh, you know, uh, decarboniz decarbonizing building uh, materials and industrial input materials, uh, but energy efficiency, we find, can get us um, can account for half of the movement toward um, our carbon reduction goals. And if anybody's interested in learning a little bit more about that, I'd be happy to uh, to share that analysis. Um, and so feel free to to send me an email at the address in my slides. All right, uh, Susan, would you be willing to speak to kind of without mandates? Won't how do you feel about won't build, builders in Virginia build homes that meet Maryland standards because they would save the buyer money or that the home would appeal to energy conscious buyers? What are your thoughts on kind of that? So they of don't. Question? I mean, they, they just don't. <laughs> the proof is in the pudding, right? Um, I'm, and they're builders that that do um, build, strong, build better homes and, and advertise them for that. It's interesting to me that a lot of them advertise like walk, walkability, and then you find out that they're um, lead qualified buildings, and you're like, well, why didn't you market that too? But that doesn't seem to be um, a strong uh, a push. Um, and then let's see, yeah, they just don't do it, and and we'd love to see that happen. One of my neighbors works for a very large um, builder, nationwide builder. And we had a conversation the other day and their largest investor is Blackstone. And Blackstone has told them that they've got to get to carbon neutral, neutrality by some date specific, or they're gonna pull their money. Um, that's what works with builders. Money talks, the rest of us walk. Sounds like an incentive to me. <laughs> uh, Jen, um, how can local governments best position themselves to take advantage of available funding 
as well as to provide non-monetary incentives to advance building retrofits? Yeah, so I think um, certainly in terms of the, the federal funding that's out there, I think it's just, you know, um, it takes doing your homework, reaching out to those agencies to make sure you're aware of schedules for when you need to apply for funding. You know, some of those funds are competitive and you have to put in a, a, um, a proposal for how you'll how you'll uh, uh, allocate those funds in your community, but others like uh, some of the programs that will be included in the um, if the build back better plan passes, for instance, uh, there is uh, a significant program for home retrofits and the nice thing about this is it's the first time we would see actual federal incentive dollars um, grant, grant money to homeowners instead of tax credits um, or tax deductions which are you know can't be used by everybody. Um, so these would be um, actual grant dollars and they would be allocated based on a, on a formula to cities and states. But uh, those that have uh, plans in place and programming in place for how they can deliver those uh, funds in their communities will certainly uh, be able to make the best use of, of that. So I think finding out, uh, you know, doing the research to understand what would be included in those programs. And then as DOE puts the rules together, uh, making sure you're on top of that. Um, in terms of incentives, you know, this is a this is an interesting question and one that, um, you know, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more, um, you know, from uh, Susan or Tom or some of the other folks on the call uh, with more knowledge of, of the rules in Virginia. Um, a number of cities have done things like past uh, local you know, ordinances as ways to raise funds to support those incentive dollars. And so these could be things like um, you know, a fee on plastic bags, but I understand that Arlington wasn't allowed to do that. I think I, I read somewhere that Arlington was not allowed by the state to, um, to do a plastic bag fee. Um, it, it we just now got a we just now got a plastic bag fee. It right. started January one, January but I think one. but I think there may have been constraints on where the money had to go. Okay, um, but I don't remember the details of that. I was just so glad to get a plastic bag fee. Yeah, right. So I think you know so so different types of local tax you know taxes um, through fees on you know it can be uh, fees on any number of um, of activities uh, could go toward toward that. Um, some uh, localities have been uh, successful in working with local foundations. Uh, this is something that it can be a little bit harder to get the larger national foundations to support, but most communities have local foundations, and some have been interested in doing this, particularly uh, retrofits to support low and moderate income homes. Um, so those are some of the opportunities that are out there. So what do, do county jurisdictions need to do to actually position themselves to take advantage of those opportunities because there's you know it takes it takes effort and in, in, in resources to actually get those funds and resources so they're good examples of, of how different jurisdictions position themselves yeah for the federal funds in particular do you mean it's just any funds it's just okay we want to do retrofits of buildings um, how do we actually get this implemented? How do we encourage and incentivize people to put energy efficiency units in their homes? Um, you know, this is for especially individuals and e any property owners, it's, it can be overwhelming. Yeah, it really can. So I think um, the kind of technical assistance, you know, I know that the it sounds like um, uh, the AIR program in Arlington does provide some guidance to homeowners and commercial building owners on how they can, um, you know, what kind of projects they can put together, how they can access financing. Um, I would really suggest that, um, that folks take a look at our local policy database for more information in our city scorecard. There are a lot of case studies in different ways that uh, local governments have, uh, have, um, gone about getting those funds, whether it's from foundations and private sources or through federal government. And then the, uh, the ready to go report that I mentioned focused specifically on how local jurisdictions can prepare themselves 
uh, to get federal funding, but it includes a whole host of case studies on different clean energy projects and programs that local governments um, have funded through federal and other funding sources. So I think those are uh, some really good resources uh, for more specifics. Did anybody want to speak to kind of the fact that the contractor automatic reply for replacing a gas furnace is another gas furnace, kind of that marketplace thing and um, I don't know. How yeah, you really have to do your homework up front, right? Um, my sister just had her house she and her husband put up new siding with additional insulation, new windows in a 30 year old home. And they're so pleased with it. And she said, well, you know, the furnace is, furnace is getting to end of life. And I said, do your homework now. Don't get caught in the middle of the winter like I did, where it's, it's a horror story what happened to me. And I just replaced it with a gas furnace because it was cold and I didn't have the time to figure out how to get the electricity run to that location to support a heat pump. You got to do your homework ahead of time. You got to know what the situation is. You want to do your research about what it's going to take in terms of getting the electricity to the location and um, you know, pick out your heat pump ahead of time and know what you want to buy and maybe do a preemptive replacement, right? You're going to get that money back because it's going to be so much more energy efficient. Right. Right. Yeah. I just a couple other quick thoughts if I could throw them in, because uh, I think this is a really important one. Um, you know, folks can reach out to um, to utilities. I, mean, I would even suggest, you know, in, in Virginia, I'm not sure if there's a building performance contractors association. There's certainly one in in Maryland. Um, that many of those contractors probably serve Northern Virginia as well. Uh, there's also the Building Performance Institute uh, and the Building Performance Association that can help you find the kind of contractors in your area. But you know, call call and talk to the contractors, and if they're you know if they're reluctant to your ideas, call somebody else. Um, like you, Susan, you know, I had some issues with this, and I finally found a contractor that's like, you know, usually he's supportive. Sometimes he's like. I think you're crazy, but if this is what you want me to do, you know, you've talked to me about why I understand, you know, where you're coming from and, you know, he'll have my business for life. Right. So, um, you know, so I think that's important to find those. Uh, some of the other things that we're looking at in programs, uh, some of the utilities, particularly uh, electric only utilities are restricted and they're not able to push programs that call for fuel switching. So that's definitely something that can be advocated for with the utility commission in, in the effort to move. And, and it sounds like Susan, you might have something else to say about that. Well, we have exactly that situation in Virginia and in RDC, um, I believe has legislation um, that will be put through this year, well, that will be, um, brought up this year in the General Assembly that allows for change in, it's a one word change in the law that would allow um, for fuel switching. So, yeah. so and we're advocating for, um, you know, to phase out, uh, to phase out rebates and incentives for gas fired appliances um, as a way to make the electric alternatives even more attractive. I think there needs to be a lot of education. A lot of the contractors out there are operating on really old information about old heat pumps that didn't perform well in colder temperatures. The new generation of equipment is you know, functioning well in Northern Vermont. It's not gonna be an issue in the mid-Atlantic. Um, and then I think finally, one other thing, particularly for what well, we've talked about uh, this idea um, we haven't thought it through, so I hope it's not too half baked, but it's something that I think could be really promising, particularly in the commercial sector, but also maybe for, for the residential sector, is requiring any project um, that's getting a bid to replace the heating system to also to have a bid for a heat pump system as well. So at least they have to get that information and the consumer can make that decision for themselves. Mm -hmm. Hey, I think we're going to do our last minute on just a quick uh, update um, with some thoughts from John Bloom, the Sierra Club, on the appointment of Andrew Wheeler as Natural Resources Secretary. Oh, boy. Yeah. Back over to <laughs> Maybe a few people uh, want to jump in. I, I, I saw the question, and I just wanted to say that Andy Wheeler's appointment is a call to arms, and it must be confirmed by the legislature, by the General Assembly. So there will be a fight. And, and that will be a, an opportunity for Virginians to weigh in and let Governor-elect Young can know that Andy Wheeler is too extreme for Virginia, because he is. And um, it, 
given the, the makeup of the General Assembly, I think there's a very good chance that he will not be confirmed. And, um, you know, but but it will be a fight. And and there could be deal making or something that, that gets him confirmed. So we need to, you know, we do need to speak up on that. Yeah, write to your legislators, write to the governor elect. Um, let them know that you feel really strong that this is not a good idea. Right. I think you will be hearing, I think that you, the participants, will be hearing from each of our organizations. Uh, first off, just to a questionnaire, see what, where your interests lie. Uh, and then we'll give you some information about our organizations as well. And very shortly, right on, on the heels of that, you'll be seeing initial calls for people to send letters, to send emails, to start lobbying the legislature for perhaps for this one and uh, and for other issues. Um, it looks like we'll be playing defense in Richmond this year. Uh, this is after speaking to our, our representatives, uh, but uh, we, we do, do need to stay in place. We do need to stay present. We need to show up uh, and we need to, you know, push for our climate agendas out there. So um, did we cover all the questions there, Eleanor? Yeah. Um, do you want to say any final remarks before we pull up our last two slides? Not, not particularly. I think we've, we, we, it has been a great panel. I, great hearing from Jen. Uh, and like I said, go back and look at their website. You can spend days on there looking at learning. Um, and Susan is doing an incredible work with the um, dealing with these building code issues, uh, as well as the whole Sierra clubs. So uh, please, like I keep saying, show up, uh, be there. Uh, this this climate is just too important to, uh, to 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 not. So, Tom, can I make one last comment? You sure can. I think what you'll find when you get involved in this is it's really nice to work with people that care about something bigger than themselves. Um, that's my thought whenever I deal with my Sierra Club colleagues and my FACTS colleagues and and the clinicians for climate. Um, these are people that are not just self-focused. They're focused on the betterment for all of us. So it's really heartening and they're great people to deal with. I, I, I've been finding that myself as well. The people people in this movement are, are wonderful. So um, I think, Eleanor, you want to talk about some upcoming events? Yes. Yeah, so um, in closing, again, I want to thank Tom for his wonderful job moderating all of our wonderful speakers. And then I can't um, end the evening without thanking the amazing uh, committee that put this entire series together. They've worked diligently um, for quite a while, and I think um, it's been exciting to watch this watch this come to fruition. Uh, so quickly, uh, we do want to have you keep involved, and if you're looking for some uh, lighter activities, uh, we have a couple um, events coming up uh, that we would welcome engagement in. We have our annual uh, volunteer social. Uh, next Tuesday, and that's a chance to come and learn about a lot of different opportunities to volunteer with EcoAction Arlington, including positions on our board of directors. We have our annual in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King and the National Day of Service. We have our annual uh, cleanup on Monday, January 17th, and the 44th uh, annual meeting of EcoAction Arlington will be on Wednesday, March 9th. And then uh, we were really um, happy to have you keep in touch. So I wanted to provide a last uh, slide with just um, opportunities for you to connect with all the people who uh, presented this evening. So if you're interested in connecting with any of the organizations, here's the information and this uh, slide will go out um, via email as well. So again, thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, you'll be hearing um, via email from um, all of the sponsoring organizations in the next few days. And we look forward to seeing you at future events and for taking action with you. Have a great evening. And just a reminder is that FAX has got a advocacy workshop <laughs> scheduled for next week. Is it the 14th? The, uh, um, we'll send out a link afterwards with the, the register if you're interested. Everybody will get that notice, notification, uh, advocacy training. So uh, with Bill McKibben, of all people. So. Take care all. Thank you all for very thank for showing up tonight. Thank you everybody so very much. Thank you. Thank you for the panel.